Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. This is the first one of 2021. Thank Yay. goodness 2020 is gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're excited for the new year. Um, and this will be our marine mammal highlights. And we've changed a, a little bit about how we're doing our, our highlights for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, instead of having three different animals that we kind of briefly go over, we're going to pick one each time and talk about different aspects of it and uh, just explain, get a little bit more in depth on uh, one particular animal. And what we're gonna be doing is putting out a poll on Instagram before mm -hmm. um, the next one comes up to for you guys to choose which one we'll pick two and you get to choose which one we get to do. So this week's, uh, this time was the doll's porpoise is the one that won over the minky, but it was very close and tight race. There was only it what was like a, it was a close call. Three three 20, yeah, one by yeah, three. like it was dolls was out in the front, and then Minky came back in the end, and then but it was it was very close. So Minky will show up again next time, and you'll get to choose between Minky and somebody else. So um, I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. And I am Trevor. And Trevor's going to start us off with the the introduction for these dolls porpoises, uh, and then we'll go from there. Cool. So I'll do a quick history and essentially what they look like if you're listening without visuals. <laughs> <laughs> um, the doll's porpoise is one of the two that we find here in Washington, along with the harbor porpoise, which is kind of the main focus of Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> but we do see dolls. We haven't personally seen a doll's porpoise in Burroughs Pass, I believe. But Yeah, and I don't think anybody has. That was one of the things when we... The, when there was the other group that was look, working in Burroughs Pass too, was like they don't see those two together or have not seen them yeah. there. So it's just harbor porpoise. I've only seen it. <clears throat> I've seen a doll's porpoise twice in my life, and that was out right. by the San Juans, I think. Yeah, I same here. I guess uh, out in the islands, and then when I was in Alaska. So they're around, but yeah. Um, so the doll's porpoise was named after a researcher named W. H. Doll, who was actually mainly a mollusk researcher. Really? And, yeah, most of his Fines. core species are mollusks, mollusks. Oh. but I think he named three mammals the doll's porpoise the doll's sheep and oh, really something else that was not dolls <laughs> he's the person who does the sheep too I didn't apparently know that. that's very cool so these the doll's porpoise is the largest of all porpoises mm -hmm. by a lot <laughs> they're they, massive comparison it's surprised me they can grow up to seven and a half feet long and weigh up to 490 pounds. Which is basically the size of a dolphin. Like that's the yeah. size of a small dolphin. A small dolphin, yeah. Yeah, like some of the um, like some of the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins are typically around about like seven to eight feet. Mm -hmm. More slender. And how much does <laughs> not, a harbor Not the robust weigh? 10 to 12 uh, feet ones. <laughs> yeah. How much does a harbor porpoise weigh in comparison? Harbor porpoise is about 150 pounds. There you go. And yeah. uh, f about five, five and a half feet. So Yikes. Yeah. Quite a start. Strike difference. And they're, the dolls are like bulky. They're uh, yeah. so, muscular. <laughs> they're really bulky. They have basically no B compared to, you know, if you look at their bodies, basically squished. And yeah. <laughs> they're really robust and wide with a barely a beak and a really wide peduncle to the tail area. And by beak, we're talking about the, the mouth or the rostrum that comes out. So if you think of bottlenose right. dolphin, that bottlenose that comes out, but porpoises generally don't have that. Exactly. And then and appearance wise, if you were to ID it, they have a black and white coloration, kind of like an orca. So, a, lot, a lot of times you go, look at the baby orca. Exactly. <laughs> Similar coloration, but that's their color scheme, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a good way to phrase it, actually. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And so what they have is, a, I think it's a little white tip on their dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. And then their bellies are white. And there's actually two subpopulations of doll's porpoise, the true eye and dolly types. So there's are, subspecies, not subspecies. subpopulations. Sub, yep. Sorry, subspecies, not populations, right. Um, the true eye type 
the white patch on his belly extends farther along the belly mm. towards the pectoral fins versus the belly tie is not so not as long oh interesting yeah interesting. look at the picture the the for the dolly it's basically the white patch is just behind the dorsal fin mostly back to the the back of the uh peduncle but that's where it stops yeah hmm. cool coloration differences so range wise they live basically they're restricted to the northern pacific mm -hmm. And not exactly coastal, like we see with it harvest for harbor purposes, but they'll be out in the open water as well. So they'll go, I think it's pretty much halfway down California up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. follow that archipelago, same same way, but to Japan. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. It's like if you look at the map, it's like this big chunk, like there's a North Pacific and then North Pacific, Pacific, North Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically in the North Pacific. Specifically in the North Pacific, yes. Um, yeah, from like the, the border of California and Mexico and then all of that, <laughs> all the way up from Japan, all the way over to here. The current estimate has them at around a million individuals. Hmm. Uh, I think it was NOAA. They said there's around 26,000 on the U.S. West Coast, but then up to 83,000 up in Alaska. Oh, wow. But then you have, you know, hundreds of thousands over in Japan and right that coast plus whatever's in the middle of the ocean that we're not not seeing, looking at but, yeah well and there's there's a lot they still will hunt dolls in japan oh yeah i'm going to talk about that so we'll, okay. we'll get yeah, to that at the end cool. part yeah yeah it's not not good pretty interesting um yeah and they the habitat they you're talking about like deeper water um that's one of and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later but the yeah. difference between harbor porpoise and dolls um habitat partitioning basically they're basically found dolls are in deeper water so 600 feet or more although they can be found in some shallow um, and then harbor porpoises are generally shallower than that that is where i did see the dolls porpoise was technically in the san juan islands but right. in the deeper part of the san juan islands exactly they like, they like the deeper surface, water um and the last thing i'll mention too there there is some sexual dimorphism mm -hmm. within this species so the males will have a larger and more angled dorsal fin as in not backwards but forwards actually for their dorsal fin which looks yeah. odd yeah, yeah it does. They, 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 i swear that every time i look at a doll's porpoise i'm like your dorsal fin is on backwards yeah like, yeah it's just it, not does. Right. it looks like someone screwed it on backwards <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> poor guys because like it goes straight up instead of curving or even being triangular it goes straight up and then like goes slanted down so right. it's weird <laughs> And then I read that's that the males also too have like a, when in the reproductive, uh, when they're reproductively active, they have like a bump in front of the dorsal fin that they don't. No, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Weird. That's the quick background on those guys. Cool. Oh, and I, you know what, I, since you're talking about coloration and stuff, they, they're rare cases, and I'd never actually thought about this. You always think about odd coloration, the, all, the, the white ones, right? We see mm -hmm. white versions of the different species. So you can have that like a leukistic or an albino, um, oh, but you yeah. can have a melanistic, a completely dark one, hmm. which is, I, that would be so That's That would be see. really cool to see because they're so, they're so chunky. That'd be actually yeah. pretty intimidating. It almost look like, it would almost look like a, a like a pilot whale or a false killer. Right. Whale. Yeah. <laughs> Except for that dorsal fin. I mean, that's right. the one nice thing with these guys. They are, their dorsal fin is pretty easy to identify because it is so odd looking. Yeah. And it's, and like he said, and I'll talk about this too, the, the black and then that has the white um, uh, tip and that can vary a little bit. So it's how much black and how much white is on the, uh, the dorsal fin. So I'm going to go um, from that, right? You're, you, that's what you got, Trevor? Yep, I'm good. So we're going to move on to what they eat. So kind of food and then behavior, what, how you would kind of ID them out there and um, things that you can note uh, when you're looking for them. So they can dive pretty, pretty well um, up to 1,640 feet. So pretty good for a small cetacean. Um, and they generally eat small schooling fish like anchovies or herring or hake, um, but they also like mid and deep water fish like smelt and also lantern fish, which I thought was super cool. And at first I was thinking it was the one that has the dangling thing, the deep, deep one. I'm like, oh, that's, that's not right. I always want to call that a lantern fish and it's not. Oh, that's an angler fish. It's an angler fish, mm -hmm. right? But the lantern fish are crazy. They got really big, creepy eyes. <laughs> But they're cool. Um, and they will also eat cephalopods, so your squid and octopus. Uh, and occasionally they'll eat crustaceans like crab and shrimp, which I thought was interesting. You don't really hear of cetaceans eating crustaceans. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Um, but I just wanted to run over real quick the the we don't know uh, especially around here you know too much about these guys they have been uh, haven't been researched as much as other cetacean species um, but the most recent study that we have for diet um, included uh, and this includes a, a paper from 1998 and then also this one from 2013 so this is what has been collected over those two studies Pacific herring uh, Eucalon uh, walleye pollock Pacific hake blackfin sculpin California headlight fish, which I just want to see a picture of that because it sounds funny. Right. Wow. <laughs> Northern lampfish, broadfin lampfish, um, protomycumphum species. I don't know what that is. They didn't put the common name in there. Uh, this one's cool. Northern smooth tongue. Nice name. Hmm. Uh, black belly eel pout, Pacific sand lance, Northern sculpin, Pacific sand dab, rex sole, butter sole, English sole. And then um, a mussel worm, which is likely more likely eat, they eat a, ate a fish that had a mussel worm in it, Probably. rather than eating it itself. And then opalescent squid, berry hookarm squid, and fiery hookarm squid. And then a, a crustacean, Crangonidae, is the family for that one. So cool. they have a, a pretty wide diet, and all, there's quite a few of those that that cross over to um, that harbor porpoises also eat, like herring, eucalon, molly pollock, hake. Uh, a lot of those are, are uh, black belly eel pelts as well. Um, so a lot of times though, they do have overlap in what they eat, but like we said before, the habitat, that, that's kind of how they live together if they, if they are in the same area where the doll's porpoise will primarily feed in the deeper water and the porpoises will feed in the more shallow water. So it's a way for you to eat the same thing and in the same area, but not be competing with each other directly. Gotcha. Handy. Makes um, sense. <laughs> they're smart animals um so the uh behavior they can swim really fast you guys know how fast they can swim Yo, oh yeah i do that was one of my fun yeah. facts actually 55 kilometers per hour that's crazy it's like 30 knots 55? 55 i mean obviously not for long periods of time but and if you've been out and never seen them they also um, they're, they're really, really fast when they come up and they surface, a lot of times what you're going to see is just the water and not actually the animal, because when they come up, they come up surface real quick and they call have, that's my daughter. Sorry. Um, they have, uh, they create a rooster tail splash. So they basically create a bow wave when they come up and surface and it splashes out kind of looking like the back of a rooster's tail. Um, and what's cool about it is that it cones over, so it's hollow in the center. So when they come up, they can still breathe when they're, because that's what they need to do, um, as the water rushes over and they don't inhale the water. I have a um, video somewhere. Uh, we were on a, I don't know, 15 foot boat, 20 foot boat, and they were just going nuts around the boat. Yeah. But my video is just, you know, it's splash, and then you can maybe see a shadow go away. <laughs> right. Well, the ones I took in Alaska, I still need to go through them, but I'm pretty sure most of them, I was taking them from a cruise ship. So like most of them are probably just splashes of water. <laughs> But there's like, pew, 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 pew. it's very, very cool. But unlike uh, other porpoises, uh, they actually like boats to, in comparison to the other ones. Um, they will bow ride, which most porpoises are like, I don't like boats. I'm going to hang it over here. You guys stay away. But the dolls are much more likely to bow ride and interact that way. Cordelia. He's super excited about Dal's porpoise. I'm liking this. It's very good. Um, so they normally feed at night um, when the prey migrates to the surface. So when they're coming up the that probably deep scattering layer and things. Um, so, and that's similar to other porpoises like harbor porpoises. A lot of studies have shown that they tend to increase feeding at nighttime. So um, common there. Uh, they, their teeth are really small just like harbor porpoises and it's made for grabbing so they just you know they can grasp their prey they don't tear it or rip it generally um but they have 38 to 56 small spade shaped teeth on each jaw so upper and lower um and the size is of a piece of grain of rice or 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 grain like and when we got the harbor porpoises teeth that one time i was like i knew they were small but when we got them i was like oh my god yeah <laughs> things pretty are crazy and they actually, which is interesting, in between each teeth, they have um, these little growths called gum teeth. And they think that that's for helping grasp things like especially slippery squid. Hmm. So I thought that was kind of cool. That is cool. Um, so they go down, they grab all those things. And again, a wide variety. So any species that is able to eat 
more than just one thing is going to be better off if any of those things start doing not so great. They have other options. Um, so that's always a good thing for them. Um, they can be seen sometimes, uh, well, they're generally in small groups, so two to 12, like also common with porpoises, generally smaller groups, but they do see some large aggregations from hundreds to thousands, and that's if you're going to be more in the offshore waters. So here in the Salish Sea, you might see some that are up to, you know, in that two to 12 range or even up to a couple dozen, but seeing hundreds or more would more likely be much farther um, out uh, in more open water. Um, they can be seen with Pacific white-sided dolphins, shortfin pilot whales, and some other larger whales. So sometimes you'll see them associating with other cetaceans. And I, they didn't really explain much more about that. I'm not sure if we know too much, but they've been seen in association with them. Um, let's see, that um, is pretty much it. They do have, uh, they do have low frequency quick clicks um, that they presume for use for echolocation. Um, and that's all I have. Oh, one more thing about the um, ability to photo ID them. So since that's kind of a big thing we do here at Pac-Man and a lot of species are, are researched um, and knowing individuals, they can do it. It has, they've tried it in the 1990s with the population up here. Um, and they looked at the shape of the dorsal fin, how much white versus how much black and the shape of that makes from where the coloration ends. Um, and then also nicks and notches on their, on their dorsal fins. Um, so you, it can be done, but when they did it in the 1990s, only 21% of the photos were actually usable. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and so some of that's because, when, again, you're gonna get lots of water when they're- Right. It ha they have to do the slow roll in order for them to be able to use the photo. So that reduces how many you'll get. And then um, just, you know, their behavior is difficult. And then how many of them are actually uh, identifiable? So. Mm -hmm. uh, over the five months that they did that study, there was a rapid decrease in new IDs, which means that maybe um, a lot of them don't have identifying marks, right? So it's either mm -hmm. they ID'd all the animals or a lot of them don't have marks that can re be readily ID'd. Because again, you're looking at pigmentation patterns too. It's going to be really difficult to be specific um, to right. have those details that you need in the photos. Yeah, that's interesting. Because again, with such striking coloration, you'd immediately assume like, oh, I'm sure you could photo ID those guys because they're, you know, they're so striking. Right. But so that's very, that's actually very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Not so much sometimes. Um, and then I had some stuff about hybrids, but I think you're probably going to talk about that. So yes. Yeah. So I, yeah. You already took one of my fun facts. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, basically some interesting factoids about the doll's porpoise. And yeah, I'll talk more about the doll's porpoise hybrids. So just kind of wrapping up the general population information, um, like Trevor mentioned, as far as we know, doll's, doll's porpoise are considered fairly abundant. Um, for here in the United States, um, the populations have been divided into two different stocks by NOAA. So they've been divided into the Alaskan stock and the California, Oregon, and Washington stock. So our, the doll's porpoise that we're seeing down here are basically all part of, considered part of the same stock. And basically they, you know, they acknowledge they don't really have enough information to go any deeper than that in terms of dividing them into further management units. But at the moment, that's what they've basically divided them into here in the United States area. Um, in terms of threats facing the doll's porpoise, so one of the largest threats is hunts. Um, so as we mentioned previously, they are still a species that is hunted uh, by Japanese fishermen. They are predominantly hunted for meat. And this is actually the largest cetacean hunt. Um, so they take up to about, well, I think they take around 18,000 doll's porpoise per year. This um, is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that, you know, Obviously that's very contentious. Um, the fact that they are taking them for meat, I think some people feel makes it a little bit better because at least they are actually using the animal. Um, yeah. But you could, you could argue all of the, we're not, we're not gonna get into that whole conversation here, but it is pretty <laughs> interesting. I actually did not know that. I was not aware that they were that widely hunted actually no um, in, terms of, in terms of numbers. Um, so like I said, they are only hunted in the North Pacific region. In the, by the Japanese fishermen, but yeah, I had no idea they were taking that many. Um, in relation to fishing, obviously another threat facing them, like many other cetaceans, is entanglement in fishing gear. 
Um, and they are particularly susceptible to entanglement in drift nets, trawling gear, and gill nets. So basically those larger net-based um, fishing methods that would kind of just catch them up by mistake and then they wouldn't be able to get back up to the surface to, to breathe. And so effectively they'd probably just drown in the net. Um, yeah, and I and saw those that are one there, uh, there was a lot around salmon fishery, which is interesting because they, they don't eat salmon as far as we know. And that's right, and I mean, they ones. could be, they could actually be like potentially foraging on, on similar species um, right. or just found in the same area and just by default of being in the same location. Well, and I guess yeah. they put they put them down at night and then they just leave them out overnight and then they pull them up like some of the right. big so nests. So that's the thing so if you're moving feeding. through the area. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a problem. And then the other one is the other main one is contaminants. So that's becoming more and more of an issue for all marine mammals. Um, contaminants. So we're talking about um, various toxins and, you know, to runoff uh, chemicals that are contained in runoff. Um, that enters the ocean ecosystem and that bioaccumulates up the food chain. So the fish that the doll's porpoise are eating contain a small amount of contaminant. The more of those they eat, the more that builds up in the doll's porp doll porpoise system um, and it gets stored in the fat molecules. So basically where we see this becoming a problem is especially when the animal is emaciated or if they're not getting enough food, um, they'll start to, just like humans, will start to metabolize our fat stores. And if once they do that, if their fat has these contaminants being stored in there, they're going to get basically dosed with contaminants every time they have to metabolize fat cells. Um, and actually speaking of food, um, and Cindy, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but they typically eat up to 12 kilograms, which is 28 pounds of food every day. I mean, yeah, I meant to put that in there too. Yeah, 28 to 30 pounds of food a day, which is yeah. I mean, they're a chunky animal, so it actually makes sense. And because they are doing those really rapid speeds, because that was my other fun fact, um, because they are doing these really high, you know, not all the time, like Cindy said, but like they will do these high speed sprints, they do need a lot more energy. Um, and so the other thing, which we already mentioned, so our nice little hook there. So talking about the habitat partitioning, um, before we get into hybridization. Um, we have noticed that, like Cindy said, the doll's porpoise and the harbor porpoise occupy similar yet quite different habitats. So they might be, their ranges could overlap, but where you find them in the environment tends to be different. Um, and especially in our region, we've definitely, it's been noted that when you have a lot of doll's porpoise in the area, that seems to correspond with a decline in the number of harbor porpoises being seen in the area and vice versa. So when we have like right now, when we have, you know, very large numbers of harbor porpoise in our area that seem to be doing really well, the number of dolls seems to actually go down in the area. And we don't really know 100% why that is. Um, it's possible that they are, um, you know, competing for some food sources. And so if you have too many of one, there's just not enough food for the other. And so they move to a different location maybe they just don't like each other and they're like, okay, there's too many of you here now. We're just going to move on out because like, we kind of don't love being around you guys. We're cousins, but like, you know, not really feeling this. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Like I said, we really don't, we don't fully understand why that happens. Um, and it yeah, doesn't it seem very like the striking numbers... where it's like years oh, it's, where yeah, it's like it's... dolls, no Harbor, lots of Harbor, no dolls. And they fluctuate yeah. back and forth every. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, that's the thing. It, it's not necessarily causational. However, it's definitely a trend. Um, yeah. And like I said, that's kind of interesting because these guys do actually interact sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the whole theory of like, maybe they don't like each other, probably not true. Um, well, at least one likes the other one. I mean, right. Yeah. So we're going to talk about hybridization because this is one of the coolest things, in my opinion, one of the coolest mm -hmm. things, especially because we study harbor porpoises. So basically before, before 1994, they had started to see some kind of odd colored porpoises basically um, in and around the kind of Southern Gulf Island area. So these porpoises basically, they couldn't tell what they were. So they were either all gray, all black or were kind of similarly colored to harbor porpoises but were behaving more like a doll's porpoise. So mm -hmm. either you had some really weird acting harbor porpoises <laughs> Which or some <laughs> really oddly colored dolls, porpoises, or something in between. So basically they were assuming, okay, well, because of their behaviors, which are quite unique to dolls, porpoise, especially in that area, they're probably just a weird version of a doll, like a leucistic version of a doll, or like right. some other sort of odd morph, basically, of a dolls, porpoise. But 
when a dead pregnant female doll's porpoise washed ashore in 1994 and they did a necropsy on it, they actually found a fetus in her that was fathered by a harbor porpoise. Mm -hmm. So they actually did the genetics on it and they could confirm that the male contribution to that fetus was from a harbor porpoise. Mm -hmm. So this was the first documentation of that hybrid cross in porpoises. Um, which is pretty incredible. And it was only the second hybrid actually that was documented between cetaceans in the, the cetacean species in the, in the wild. Oh, really? Was it the second? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the first documented was the um, fin whale, blue whale hybrid. Right, yeah. 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 So <laughs> once they discovered this, they're like, oh my gosh, so what have we been seeing this whole time? So this prompted. <laughs> so how many of them are there out there? <laughs> right. So this prompted a whole a whole like effort basically and a bunch of studies looking into this and trying to establish um what was going on here and this was actually studied um or sorry i believe this was actually published in 1998 there's a paper um published in the canadian journal of zoology mm -hmm. from 1998 that goes into detail about the um the hybridization of these two species and their findings um, i just found, i just found another recent one's in 2014 they did one in, in uh, canada yes yeah mm -hmm. they did mm-hmm um, so obviously these, you know, these studies are still ongoing. We're still trying to learn about this. Um, mm -hmm. And what they, what they found is that it does seem as though they were typically, if not always, female doll's porpoise mating with male harbor porpoises. So one of the things to know about harbor porpoises, and are, I'm sure that we'll talk about this in a later podcast, is as my, as my college professor put it one time, they're pretty frisky. So the, the male's harbor porpoise are not only fairly small and can kind of turn on a dime and very maneuverable, but they also are pretty aggressive when they're mating. Like they are, they are going to mate with you. If they've decided they're going to mate with you, they're going to try. They're going to do it. And obviously have, the female harbor the porpoise, are, they do, they do check out our Facebook page for evidence yeah. of that. Um, <laughs> But the, they, what they think is that the doll's porpoise are probably just not used to that mating style. And so mm. they basically get taken by surprise. Um, <laughs> I would be. <laughs> right? Yeah. I would be. I mean, I, I, yeah. If you've, if you've seen a male harbor porpoise picture, I would be a little. I would yeah. definitely be taken by surprise if I was a female doll. I was like, what mm -hmm. is going on? Um, but it's also interesting that it, it, it does not seem like the male doll's porpoise are seeking out female harbor porpoise mates. Right. Um, and that may just so be a, a behavioral difference between those species that, that just right. doesn't kind right. of occur to them like meh. Right, exactly. And that's what I mean. It could actually just be the fact that the male harbor porpoise are have much more a much stronger drive to mate. Um right. and so they have also because two of the female hybrids that they identified in this study actually did have calves traveling close with them, it's it seems fairly evident that the female can actually produce a live hybrid offspring. And so yeah. there has. No, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> it's true. Just, it's, not, it's not normal to have, it's like you, a lot of times hybrids are not fertile. Like that's Correct. kind of a big thing. So the, so the, the fact common, that it is a viable. example is the mule, right? That's like right. the typical, the typical example where you can produce an offspring, but that offspring itself Can't is not fertile. Back. Correct. Um, and so at this point, it's actually getting a little bit confused where they're like, well, honestly, at this point, how do we know what we're looking at? How do we know if we're looking at a hybrid or if we're looking at a harbor porpoise or if we're looking at a doll's porpoise? Like if they can actually cross mate back. You, you effectively dilute the genes. So it's mm -hmm. not going to be obvious that it's a 50-50 split between the two because it's not. Now it's a 75-25. Then it's a 90-10. <laughs> yeah. And so in our area, what one of the, actually one of the articles that I was reading um, suggested that actually some of those color differences so like either having an animal that's all gray all black or is similar to harbor porpoise coloring but maybe acting a little more weird. playful or, or weird mm -hmm. those are all potential indicators of seeing a, a hybrid hybrid individual um and interestingly the, the hybrids are typically in terms of their behavior um they're typically seen either on their own or with the doll's porpoise because the doll's female is the one giving birth so you know, the, the, it, does, it doesn't seem to want to seek out more harbor porpoise. It seems to stay with the dolls or just kind of end up being a loner, maybe because it's been shunned by its conspecifics or maybe because it just, 
you know, acts differently and doesn't really know how to interact with the doll's porpoise. Yeah, that's what I thought was interesting because they, you know, in the one paper that I read, it said they, um, the aggregating behavior of harbor porpoises, where sometimes you find them in those larger groups, might be why it tends to go with males being the harbor porpoises that um, that do it, where the doll's porpoises around the area and the male goes off and is like, woo, mm-hmm. <laughs> goes takes advantage yeah. while, he's, while she's near. But then the fact that the doll's female has the baby, he grows up in doll's society. And so mm-hmm. therefore is going to act generally more like a doll. Now maybe ha- have some odd things that come out because it does have a lot of harbor purpose genes, but generally, so it's going to want to stay around doll's purposes. And so there's less likely that it, it will, like you said, go after or want to be with harbor purposes. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the other, the other theory that was suggested for why it was typically the males mating with the female dolls um, is because there was a decline in harbor porpoises, especially around this region, um, there's also been a suggestion that maybe there were just fewer female harbor porpoises. And so the males were kind of going crazy, like, oh my gosh, well, we, we need to make, we need to pass our genes on. We need to mate with something. Right. These guys are around. They look similar enough. Sure. Let's give that a shot and see, if, see what happens. So mm-hmm. that's another potential theory. Yeah. We, we talked about that with, uh, on one of the other podcasts, we talked about a hybrid uh, for the larger whale species. Um, that would have been the fin whale blue whale the, hybrid? I think the fin, yeah i think so um and the same thing of like that happens a lot of times when there are not enough females for whatever reason and mm-hmm. so if you have something that's close enough to you that that drive for mating and passing on your genes will kind of push you yeah so that's the that's the story of the uh dolls porpoise harbor porpoise hybrids so, and especially if you are in the salish sea region up here where we are and out on your boat and if you see these animals if you see a harbor porpoise or you see are lucky enough to see some dolls porpoise take a closer look and see if <laughs> see what you're see if you can figure out yeah. what you're looking at maybe maybe you are witnessing a hybrid swimming by you mm-hmm. and look at like right now we're at that the in the, the back and forth of of them which one is the more prevalent in the in the area right now it's lo- the harbor purposes are everywhere and dolls are not around very much so if you're out most likely you're going to see a harbor porpoise they said lucky enough to see adults, maybe even luckier <laughs> you mm-hmm. have to see a hybrid. Yeah. I think it was interesting it's pretty, it's that you could, cool. yeah, that you, that it's the, you know, the coloration of physical differences, but also you could identify one potentially by that as well as the behavior. Yeah. I Seeing thought the behavioral of, differences that that, yeah. that that was a trait that was carried in the genes. I thought was really interesting mm-hmm. and, or, I mean, they are growing up in doll's porpoise society. Right. So that's the other thing is maybe they and obviously learned. they would have enough, hopefully, of the physical traits to be able to maintain and sustain those behaviors as well, like the faster speeds and that type of thing. So mm-hmm. how much of it is nature? How much of it is nurture? Good question. Right. Probably both. Right. This so. is, yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's probably not it's not one or the other. It's yeah. a mixture of the two. And where that yeah. lands is interesting. Yeah. So there we Very go. Cool. That's the doll's porpoise. Cool. Our little baby orcas not. <laughs> <laughs> But their, their coloration is, is very cool, the black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that will cover it for the doll's porpoise. Um, we will, I think, like I said, be doing another species next. It'll be, a, the poll will be between a minky and something else. We still have to figure out what the other one will, will be for the poll. Uh, but please yeah. do vote. We love seeing that interaction um, and helping, having you help us decide what, we're, what we get to talk about next. Yeah. Um, well, we also just want to be talking about stuff that you guys want to learn right. about too. So that's the biggest thing is if you have a species and feel free to, again, like you can comment on and send us a message on Instagram or on Facebook um, or comment on our website. And if there is something specific that you'd like to hear about that you're not seeing in our polls, mm-hmm. please let us know or shoot us an email. Uh, we'd yeah. love to love to be able to talk about stuff that would be helpful for you guys to learn too. Yeah. Cause we think they're all cool. So we don't really care. Yeah. We're a little biased because we they're all awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that will do it for this week and welcome to 2021. Let's hope this year is a better one than last. And um, we hope you're having a great start to the year and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M dot org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today.
Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.